But I will tell you that I am absolutely filled with gratitude to be here because I wouldn't be here without um, the influence of Jerry Williams. Um, we have a, a memorial show of Jerry's in Newport at Salve Regina University where we'll have a reception tomorrow and it's quite beautiful and I hope you all can make it over there. And there's other shows in Newport that will also be open in some of the grand mansions of Newport. So check out the program, come visit us. Um, before art and social responsibility became somewhat of a cliche of the postmodern condition, there was the life and work of Jerry Williams. Born in India in 1926 to missionary parents, Jerry carried the life and philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi deeply within the fabric of his being. This commitment to a Gandhian type of pacifism and social engagement landed the young Williams in jail in 1948 when he refused to register for the draft as required by the Selective Service Act. He was released a year later for good behavior and was assigned to do alternative service for the next two years. Upon being released from prison and subsequently finishing his time as a civilian public servant, he moved to Concord, New Hampshire in 1950 to study under the tutelage of Vivica Haino as he graduated from sweeping the floor to wedging clay, the legacy was born. In 52, he began his own workshop, later moving to Dunbarton, New Hampshire in 1955, where his studio still stands. In 1955, he also married his partner and soulmate, Julie Blake, and the journey of the New Hampshire Potter Laureate began. Williams always remained committed to making functional pottery, marketing his work through the New Hampshire League of Crafts, various galleries, and his own studio showroom. He became active in the American Crafts Council and the Haystack School, drawing accolades and recognition from the wider crafts community. The year 1972 was a significant and poignant one for Williams. During this one year, Jerry's studio burnt to the ground. The premier issue of Studio Potter magazine was published, and Jerry and Julie started the first Phoenix workshops. All of these events converged to provide for a very active and productive life of clay and community. In his work, Monolith, made in 1973, but um, really about 1972, he graphically illustrated the frenetic energy of his experience and feelings in a crowded montage of figure, architecture, and typography, declaring his political concerns, personal interests, and career transformation. This graphic chronology stands as a self-reflective monolith, telling the story of momentous change in the direction of his commitment to the wider ceramics community and his uh, consistent pacifist convictions as the Vietnam War continued to escalate. Again in 1972, um, with Jerry's studio in smoldering ruins, the residual uh, result of a kill fire, potters from all over New England gathered to rebuild his studio of a, in a period of about three weeks. This demonstrable show of respect and affection for Williams changed his life, and for that matter, changed the entire ceramics community. This discernible action, along with a commitment from a small group of local potters, saw Studio Potter magazine take shape around the Williams kitchen table. His first Phoenix workshops were to become gathering places for visiting artists and students from around the country and the world. Like the mythic image of a phoenix rising from the ashes of a destroyed studio, a new expanded career path presented itself to Jerry as a leading figure in the field of contemporary ceramics. While his pots were his livelihood, he continued to sustain a body of work he called political effigies that provided a format to realize his political and social conscience in clay. Carrying the independent spirit of Gandhi that he witnessed as a young boy in India, he used this vehicle to advance the advanced these works as a commentary on the social and political climate of the tur turbulent 60s and beyond. These pieces 
sometimes exhibited some of his signature technical innovations, like his reduction reds or photo resist work, while others stood as a narrative vehicle for his socio-political point of view. For over 40 years, beginning with CIA portrait in 1964 and ending with late-term abortion, 2004, the artist as activist continued to raise his voice, not necessarily for public consumption, but as a personal declarative act of social commentary and responsibility. Williams' work here, Support Your Local Police, 1969, raises a familiar voice that resonates today as communities still struggle to reconcile the relationship between law enforcement and the communities they serve. This primitive folk art approach to architectural form and decorative embellishments raises issues relevant to Selma, Detroit, Kent State, and other disturbances still seemingly unresolved some 45 years later. The work La Pentasia de Cesar Chavez 1972, commemorates the incarceration of activist and labor leader, Cesar Chavez, a kindred spirit of Williams, undoubtedly reflecting on his own incarceration based on social principles, the artist sympathetically aligns himself with the plight of the migrant workers movement in our country. The crowded figures stand together in solidarity, much like the artist stood in principle with Chavez and his people. His last piece, Partial Birth Abortion Law, 2004, stands modestly in scale and potently in message. Williams wrote, Partial Birth Abortion Law is a political satire based on a published photograph of President George Bush, Bush with Washington politicians. Bush sits at a desk with a white uterus in front of him and is surrounded by male politicians smiling and clapping their hands with their penises visible. This bill prevents a woman from having an abortion even if faced with the possibility of injury or death. The irony of the, of the event involves a group of men promoting a law which concerns women only. These are times rife with possibilities for artistic satire. I have found a valuable venue for sculpting among themes suggested in newspapers, magazines, and other media. Clay lends itself to a sense of immediacy in themes considered important to me to articulate." End of quote. The power of artistic satire and freedom of expression was never more poignant than a few months ago in France when terror struck and the slogan, Je suis Charlie, flew across the internet as the world was shocked as the power of the, sat the satirical image incited an extremist act of violence and rage. I am quite certain that Jerry would have responded to this horror, fusing Clay and his passion for nonviolence and social commentary. From its modest beginnings around the Williams kitchen table in Dunbarton, supported by a group of New Hampshire area potters, Studio Potter Magazine became arguably the most significant first person journal in ceramics. Like the field it served, it developed from a technical resource into a more serious journal addressing issues related to education, aesthetics, history, apprenticeship, and other, top, uh, other relevant topics to an evolving field. Jerry and his partner, Julie, visited studios from coast to coast, photographing potters at work, knitting together a family of studio potters from places in which they lived and worked to the pages of magazines, from Philadelphia with Bill Daly, and uh, Bob and Paula Winokur. I warned Bob that, you know, um, don't get nervous if your face shows up here, you're not dead yet. Um, and Paula, of course, looks exactly the same. So um, anyway, from Philadelphia to Montana to California to Minnesota with a pondering Mark Ferris and Georgia, Ron Myers, their life, Jerry and Julie's life and work in the wider community of makers took shape like the material clay, one gesture, one moment at a time, building a life in clay. Jerry Williams has been honored and revered by the American Crafts Council with his gold medal. He was an honorary member of Enseca in 1984. He was an advocate and leader in promoting a national apprenticeship effort. His home state, 
made him New Hampshire's first artist laureate. The truth of the matter is, when, when I remember when Jerry was given this honor by the state of New Hampshire as the first artist laureate, he said to me, I really would prefer Potter laureate. And he said, you know, maybe Studio Potter can start a movement and every state in the union would have a Potter laureate. Wouldn't that be great? It was typical Jerry transferring you know, his own honor onto us, you know. Um, anyway, he was the guiding light and editor of Studio Potter magazine for over 30 years. A man of objects and a man of words, he was mostly a man of community as he spun together a voice and a life in clay. Due to Julie's illness, Jerry was not able to deliver the closing address at the Inseca Shared Journeys Conference in Jingdejen in 2008. In his paper, in his paper, he wrote, quote, what is important is being in motion, on the move. The experience is not rigid and static, but expanding, changing, growing. We are friends and fellow travelers, not competitors or challengers. We are moving towards a common goal, end of quote. On a more personal note, I built my first kill with Jerry. And I thank you, Jerry, for lighting the light of a young 27-year-old potter, showing him that not only was it possible to live this life of clay and community, but it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Thank you.